Hi, welcome to the Israel First television program with myself, Martin Blackham. In the studio today, we have Dr. Martin Sherman with us. Thank you so much for coming in today, uh, Martin. We appreciate that and uh, t taking your time. Um, uh, Dr. Martin Sherman is originally, originally from South Africa. You've lived in Israel since 1971. You served uh, seven years in operational capacities in the Israeli Defense Establishment. You were a ministerial advisor to Yitzhak Shemir's government. And you lectured for 20 years at Tel Aviv University in political science, international relations and strategic studies. You've authored two books. You're a writer for the Jerusalem Post and have spoken on the BBC, CNN, I-24 News and Israel National News. He's the founder and CEO of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies. And uh, you can go and visit the website. We'll put that on uh, for the viewers to be able to go and see or, uh, uh, all your writings. He's one of Israel's foremost strategic policy analysts and a strong supporter of an in independent Jewish state. Now, as we've come into the studio, we've had uh, the news, and this is uh, as we're recording, of the attack by Trump on Syria, on the uh, uh, Assad, I guess, regime, the airfields and everything. Do you think that we're edging towards a war in Syria? Some people would even say a world war. Well, it certainly could turn out to be a point of inflection uh, in the uh, ongoing process in, in Syria, which is, of course, something that doesn't seem to have any good outcomes on the horizon. But I think in many ways, the, for Israel and for people interested in the future of Israel, the, uh, the uh, chemical attack that prompted the American retaliation is a sharp reminder for anyone who really needed it about the kind of neighborhood that Israel lives in, the, the merciless disregard that there is in much of the Arab world for human life. And I think this is often not factored in to the proposals that Israel is being asked to accept, uh, to accept in trying to resolve the conflict. I think that once people have a clear view of the kind of brutality that pervades much of the Arab world, I think that uh, there may be far more understanding for Israel's position on security issues. And of course, in, in, the, in Lebanon and um, in Syria, we've got Hezbollah with a missile threat as well. It's uh, really a dangerous situation. They have had this uh, internal, what one, one would call a civil war really in Syria with the, the rebel factions. But um, there is the danger, of course, with all the missiles there just on, uh, on uh, Israel's border. And we had in the, the news for our viewers, we had the Israel Air Force going into uh, Syria and this uh, anti-aircraft missiles being fired at, uh, at the Israeli planes and landing in, in Jordan. And uh, so this is really a, a, a strategic threat, I guess. Well, I, I think that if you look at the buildup of rocket capability, both in the north, the Hezbollah, and in the south with the Hamas, I think this points to the underlying fallacy of land for peace. Because every single time that Israel has withdrawn from territory and handed it over to Arab control, that territory has become a platform uh, from which deadly attacks can and often are launched against Israel. Um, you know, the, the time might be different, but if you look at withdrawal from Gaza, immediately it turned into a source of violence against Israel from Judea and Samaria after the Oslo process after a few months. Um, if you look at what happened at Lebanon after a few years, and if you look what's happening in Sinai, which is turning into a security nightmare after a few decades. So I think wherever you look, the doctrine of land for peace has proved a dangerous and dramatic failure. Um, when we're talking land for peace, we're, we're really talking about the Israeli government's Trying to, uh, or trying or doing, giving away land to the Palis to the Palestinians in order to achieve that there won't be terrorism or missiles fired. Well, that's that's true. It's uh, you're trying to appease the Arabs by offering them real estate, but but I think one of the lessons that hasn't re yet been in internalized and really should be is on the Syrian front, because up until the outbreak of the civil war in Syria in 2011. Uh, President uh, Assad was being presented as a moderate reformer, even by people like Hillary Clinton, who was then Secretary of State, and as a credible peace partner. 
Now, now can you imagine the, the horrendous situation that, would, that Israel would be facing today if it had withdrawn from the Golan and the, the current forces in, uh, active in Syria had taken over? And again, there's sort of a to-no-win to situation. It would have been a no-win situation for Israel because if uh, the Assad opponents had have won, you would have had uh, uh, Sunni jihadists like uh, um, uh, al-Nusra or ISIS affiliates deploying in the Golan. And if uh, the pro-Assad forces of won, you would have had uh, Hezbollah or even Iranian Revolutionary Guards uh, deploying in the area. So, so I think the, that sort of almost by the grace of God, uh, Israel uh, did not enter into any sort of arrangement for withdrawal from the Golan because uh, you would have been facing an extremely dangerous situation. And this certainly should be a lesson for the future regarding the highlands overlooking the coastal plain, which are earmarked for a prospective Palestinian state. Because if Israel were to withdraw from the highlands there, you have no control over who would eventually take over, as the Gaza precedent uh, clearly indicates. When Israel pulled out of Gaza, the Fatah were in control. Within a few months, they were overthrown, and uh, the, the Islamist Hamas took over. There's very little reason to believe that exactly the same scenario will not happen in Judea and Samaria if Israel were to, to withdraw. And, uh, you know, history teaches us that when, when Israel wasn't in charge of all of the Golan, that they were attacked from by Syria, by uh, uh, the kibbutzes and the people who lived on the farms below were attacked and the Galilee area. What you might not realize as you're watching at home is that all of that area, there's a, is the Galilee, there's tourists, the hotel, all of that would be affected by sure, them that, being on the Golan. Sure. But whatever holds for the Golan holds several times more for the, West, the so-called West Bank, Judea and Samaria. Because you must remember that the, the post-withdrawal border in the Golan, if Israel were to withdraw, was about 70 kilometers long, abutting a largely rural and relatively uh, sparsely populated north. But as far as the Palestinian issue is concerned, the, the post-withdrawal border will be anything upward from 500 kilometers, and it would abut a largely urban area which would be heavily populated and full of vital uh, installations for infrastructure, military command, government, etc., etc. So the sensitivity of the highlands of the, of the Golan is not as great as the sensitivity of the highlands in Judea and Samaria. In fact, it, it's important. I don't want to belittle the importance of the Golan, but certainly the highlands abutting uh, the coastal plain, which is basically the, the territory uh, earmarked for the Palestinian state, has far greater uh, strategic uh, implications. And uh, Martin, you've been in the news yourself, in Israel National News, with a new video that you've done uh, regarding this very situation. Maybe. Uh, you could tell our viewers a bit about the video and then we'll, we'll show them that. Well, I think one of the uh, most important issues but which hasn't received enough attention in the media is the vulnerability of Israeli transportation axes if a Palestinian state were to be established. Uh, because the, the major north-south axis which connects the north of the country with the south uh, is the Trans-Israel Highway, uh, Route 6. Uh, and this uh, runs very close to the uh, envisaged border of the Palestinian state, and in some cases, a few dozen meters from it, almost ex uh, immediately abutting it. Uh, of course, if Israel were to ab abandon that territory, it would be extremely easy for terrorist elements to either to fire on traffic or dig tunnels underneath it and ambush, ambush vehicles. Uh, and totally disrupt any uh, routine traffic movement on it with huge security and uh, economic implications. And this isn't something that hasn't happened. We had in the, the case in the, the, the tunnels going from uh, Jerusalem to Bethlehem where Israeli drivers were sh shot at and uh, regularly there was shooting from, from sure, Bethlehem. Sure, but not only that, there have been attempts to dig tunnels from locations close to Highway 6, to the, the Trans-Israel Highway, into the Palestinian areas to allow either personnel, arms, uh, for operational uh, initiatives, etc., etc. So this is not just 
speculative scaremongering. This is something that's based on past precedent. And it's something like, if uh, uh, for our viewers in the United Kingdom, um, it's something like the M1 motorway going north-south, having something right next to sure. it with terrorists, sure. The, sure. Or, or certainly the possibility of terrorists sure. or defence, sure. who could uh, disrupt all the f this trade and people wanting to go about their business would suddenly be disrupted. So we're going to have a look at the uh, video, Martin, and um, uh, uh, you know, please uh, let Martin know that you've enjoyed this and let others know about this very important video. Hello to our viewers and welcome to our video studio at the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. For over two decades, the notion of two states for two people has been the dominant paradigm that has monopolized the discourse on the Arab-Israeli conflict in general and the Israeli-Palestinian one in particular. Our institute, IISS, has long been in the forefront in opposing this idea and has worked resolutely to expose the existential dangers this policy proposal entails for Israel. In the short video, we illustrate one aspect of the perils that Israel and Israelis can expect if the two-state principle is actually implemented. One of the gravest threats, but one that for some reason has received scant public attention, is the threat that would arise to the nation's major transportation axes should a Palestinian state be established in the areas adjacent to Israel's coastal plain. In numerous articles and interviews in the past, the founder of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, Dr. Martin Sherman, has warned repeatedly of the dangers involved in the proximity of borders of the envisaged Palestinian state to some of the country's principal traffic routes. One of the most important of these routes is the Trans-Israel Highway, Highway 6, that connects the north of Israel with the south. Several portions of Highway 6 run close to the territory designated for a future Palestinian state, and in some places is even immediately adjacent to it. In numerous locations, the distance between Highway 6 and the Palestinian population centers is less than one kilometer, and in some places, only a few dozen meters. Little imagination is needed to envisage the gory outcomes that are likely to occur if Israel were to relinquish control of the area that abuts the highway. Israel's harrowing experience following its pullout from Gaza must serve as a red light warning against what we can expect if the area east of the highway is transferred to Palestinian control. Two locations are particularly sensitive, the towns of Kalkilia and Tulkar, that are located immediately adjacent to the highway and in the past have been the sources of murderous attacks of terror, such as the horrific carnage at the Park Hotel in the coastal city of Netanyahu. Only continued Israeli control of the eastern flanks of the highway can prevent the continued bloodshed and violence inside Israel. The menace of terror tunnels and attacks can't be dismissed as unfounded scaremongering. To the contrary, in the recent past, attempts to dig such terror tunnels under the security barrier were exposed by the Israel Security Services. The intensive agricultural and commercial activity in the vicinity of the wall provide ample cover, concealment and camouflage for the excavation of terror tunnels and for setting up firing positions close to the busy highway. It's not difficult to envisage the ease with which it would be able to lay deadly ambushes along the course of the highway, or to envisage the huge economic damage that would be caused by the constant threat of disruption of traffic on the major artery connecting the north and the south of the country. מדינה פלסטינית לא תקום ביהודה ושומרון, לא נקים מדינת טרור על כביש 6. In conclusion, some words of warning from Professor Amnon Rubenstein, Israel Prize Laureate and former Knesset member and Minister of Education for the Far Left Merit faction. Israel, small and exposed, will neither be able to exist nor to prosper if its urban centers, its vulnerable airport and its roads are shelled. This is the terrible danger involved in the establishment of a third independent sovereign state 
between us and the Jordan River. Well, we hope you found that uh, video very informative on the terror tunnels and the transportation issues. Certainly, it's a very important thing, Martin, that the people get to know. And it's been in the news that you featured that. And I, I guess you're very happy for our viewers to share that and to pass that on to others. I certainly would encourage them to do so. Now, uh, in the Jerusalem Post uh, today, uh, as we come into the studio, we've had the very sad uh, funeral of the soldier who was killed uh, in the terror attack uh, near Ofra in Judea and Samaria, talking about Judea and Samaria, do you think that the terrorism is, 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 on, is going to keep going or is it? Well, I think until Israel defines a clear strategic objective, I think the terrorism will fluctuate, go up and go down and go up over and down, depending on uh, conditions which uh, come and go. Yeah, but I, I think it's very important for Israel to make a strategic decision about the future of Judea and Samaria and basically extinguish hopes for a Palestinian state. Because I think the fuel, much of the fuel of the, of the, the terror attacks are the hope that the Arabs will be able to prize the territory free from Israel's control. And once that, has been, uh, that, that hope has been extinguished, I think it will be far easier to deal with the, uh, the Arab population. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of our viewers, some of you will be very informed about this, but many of you may not, about the, the myth of the Palestinian state, that there's never been a Palestinian state, there's no currency, there's no stamps, there's nothing, well, maybe there's stamps, there's one stamp now, but there's, there's no capital or anything. So maybe you can explain a bit to our viewers about the, the, the myth of the Palestinian state. Well, the fuel that drives the campaign for Palestinian statehood is based on the Palestinian narrative. The Palestinian narrative basically is composed of five myths. The myth of homeland, the myth of nationhood, the myth of peoplehood, the myth of refugees, and the myth of statehood. Now, all these myths can be dispelled not by using Israeli materials, but by using Palestinian materials. Let me give you an example. Um, the myth of homeland. Up until 1968, the Palestinians never claimed Judea and Samaria or the West Bank or Gaza as their, um, as their ancient homeland. In fact, quite the opposite. In the original formulation of the Palestinian government, they specifically eschew any sovereign claims to Judea and Samaria, which they call the West Bank and Gaza, and assign the West Bank to Jordan and Gaza to Egypt. It was only later in the second version of the uh, Palestinian Covenant where the reference to Judea and Samaria as being part of Jordan and Gaza was removed. And I, I must remind uh, your, your viewers as well that up until 1988, all the Arab residents of Judea and Samaria were Jordanian citizens. In 1988, when uh, King Hussein gave up his claims for Judea and Samaria, uh, he basically uh, stripped them, apparently illegally by Jordanian law, of their, their, their uh, citizenship. So, first of all, the, the, the issue of, of, of homeland is something that is very flexible. Wherever the Jews happen to be, that, that, that's what the Palestinians claim for their homelands. Because if you remember, prior to the Six-Day War, there were blood-curdling threats by the Arabs that they were going to liberate Palestine. Which Palestine were they talking about? Because Israel didn't hold a square inch of what they claim Palestine is today. So then they claimed that, that the Palestinian homeland was everything west of the, the 67 Green Lines. After the Israeli victory and that territory fell to Israeli control, they started focusing on that territory, but originally as something that should be returned to Jordan. And then they would carry on look, uh, discussing the Palestinian homeland, which again would have focused on the territory west of the, the, the Green Line. Um, the issue of statelessness. The Palestinians in Judea and Samaria are stateless not because of Israel, but because the Jordanians stripped them of their, of, of their uh, citizenship. The same thing with the, the myth of refugees. Um, I, I, I don't know how much time we have to talk about that, but basically all the refugees on the face of the globe are under an organization called 
the UN High Commission for Refugees, except the Palestinians. The Palestinians have their own specific organization for refugees, and they deal only with Palestinian refugees. Now, these two organizations have different definitions of who a refugee is and different mandates for dealing with them. Uh, according to the international widely accepted universal de uh, definition of refugees, the number of refugees decreases over time. According to the Palestinian definition of refugees, the number of refugees balloons over time and is passed down over the generations from father to son. Uh, according to the, the universal mandate of how to deal with Palestinians, the, the High Commission can settle refugees in third party countries, not necessarily the countries of origin. According to the Palestinian refugee mandate, they can only take care of the their, their uh, humanitarian needs and not settle them permanently in any other country. So if you take the, the Palestinian definition of refugees and the mandate for dealing with them, you have a definition which increases the population and can only take care of the pal their humanitarian needs and not find a permanent solution for them, which by definition makes UNRWA an organization, which is UNRWA is the, the organization that deals with the Palestinians, which makes UNRWA an organization which perpetuates the problem that it's supposed to solve. So there you have three examples of the myth, the myth of the homeland, the myth of uh, uh, statelessness, the myth of refugees, the myth of, of nationhood and, and the myth of peoplehood, which are very close, but the Palestinians themselves admit that they are not a separate people, but part of a larger Arab nation and they're the same, indistinguishable from other Arab, Arab people like Syrians, uh, Lebanese, Jordanians, etc., etc. And this is not an Israeli claim. This is a Palestinian claim made by, by leading Palestinians. And so the, the whole issue of a Palestinian state is, as I say, a giant hoax based on five pernicious myths whose aim is not to establish a Palestinian state for, for Palestinian Arabs, but dismantle the state for the Jews. And the fuel that drives it is not a drive for Palestinian self-determination, but a drive to deprive the Jews of self-determination. And it's a, <coughs> it's a very strange thing because their own maps have, uh, they don't have the Israel written on the map, it's, right. it's Palestine. Um, a, mo a lot of them were, the, that were Arabs who came from different countries for migration, they came here to work. And uh, Arafat was Egyptian, he was, uh, so he was from Egypt. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's a, it's a very strange situation that they have all these people here. And I think it's very important for our viewers to understand that, you know, this is a, a myth perpetuated by left-wing media. They put out this Palestinian state, the West Bank and the trouble. And it's not, nothing, uh, and the problem is people come here to visit Israel, Martin, and they don't know this. They, they think it's some sort of football game where there's two sides, but it's not at all. This was uh, allocated by the um, League of Nations as the Jewish state. And we have a, a Muslim neighbors who don't want that, who want the Mus uh, Jewish people driven into the sea. Well, there's a lot of information on Martin's website. You're going to have to go and uh, look at that if you would like uh, further information. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you next week. Wonderful to be with you today again. And we're going to look at something very specific about the Aleph Bet, the Hebrew alphabet. And you know, maybe you are discovering that the scriptures originally were written in Hebrew. And this is very important because there is a power in the Hebrew language that even scientists are discovering and bringing to light today. So obviously having the scriptures in Hebrew can make us discovering more deeply who God is and his characteristic. Now, we were saying that there is a very specific verse and you can look at it is the verse from Zephaniah 3.8. And in this verse is the only one through all the scriptures where there is the 22 letters of the alphabet, the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet. O obviously, they are not put one by one in alphabetic order, but when you count, you can see all the letters, the 22 letters. And is that God, you know, we, we said already that God loves to uh, play with us and hide things and for us to find it. And it's like you can see with this verse that God is saying, hey, hey, you know what? The Hebrew language is very important. And look at the verse just after, next to it, Zephaniah 3, 9. Let us read it together. It said, for then will I turn 
to the people a pure language that they may call upon the name of the Lord to serve him with one uh, consent. So again, when I read that many years ago, I felt God saying, this is the Hebrew language. It's not written the Hebrew language. It's written a pure language. But when you speak with the Jewish people, they say, yes, of course, we know this is the Hebrew language. And what is written there is say, I will turn to the people, not just to the Jewish people, but to whoever wants to learn. So we have, God is going to restore this Hebrew language. We spoke already that from Genesis 1 to Genesis 11, there was only one language and it was the Hebrew language. And now we discover that the world lost it, that the Jewish people kept it, that God gave the Torah, gave the scriptures to the world. And now it's to us to discover again this amazing language to know our God more. Now I speak about this al alphabet, the Aleph Bet, in this book, the, the beauty of the Hebrew language, just for us to have a test and to discover God's more. And it's very important because God is restoring the scriptures. God is making us being more intimate with him. And this is uh, this great discovery that we have discovered ourselves and we want to share it with you. So we hope that you enjoy. You can ask for the book uh, on our website and uh, I hope that it will be a great discovery for you and a great help to grow and know God more. And from me today, bye and see you next week. Well, thank you so much for joining us in the studio today, Martin. Uh, don't forget you can email us at info at israelfirst.org. Visit our website, www.israelfirst.org. And remember, we're the program that looks at the land, the people, and the language. <music>